Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. I'm Dan alongside Matt, and as always, we're here to talk another week of Flames hockey. And Matt, I'd say this one's a much better week for the Flames. How about you? Yeah, it's finally looking like this team is starting to come together in some aspects. And, you know, they had a disappointing effort right before our show. But, you know, that's life. It happens. And let's go on. Better late than never, right? Yeah. The the world is back in alignment. The Flames are above the Oilers. The Flames are above Vancouver. We can move on with the rest of the season. Yes. Order has been restored. That's right. Well, let's look back at the week that was for the Flames. Um, after you and I recorded last time, last Monday on the 6th, Calgary was on the road, the last of their two-game road trip, their dad's trip. And I guess you could say this team plays better with parental supervision as the Calgary Flames ended up beating the Chicago Blackhawks. I thought a pretty good game overall from the team. A 2-1 win for the Flames with uh, Lindholm getting both goals. Yeah, this team definitely had a better start than in that first Chicago game uh, on New Year's Eve. And I think that it was because of them getting humbled in that game that they came out with a lot better of an effort. Do you think you send the coach in to give them the pregame talk, or do you think you send the dads in there? Uh, I I think that you'd have to send the dads in there of like, hey, we're actually having to watch this stuff. Uh, you know, do you think, don't play like crap. Do you think you should have the dads stand in front of each of their boys, stare them down like when they're kids, and say, son, I'm disappointed I, in you. Yes. I'm not mad. I'm just disappointed. Right. <laughs> I didn't come all the way from Switzerland, from Sweden to watch this crap, son. <laughs> no wonder why Lindholm scored both. <laughs> you know, I was thinking the whole time. I'm thinking, heck, if the dads are there, like, and they're doing so well, why can we bring the dads for the rest of the season? Yeah. Just have them stare their kids down. That's right. You know, come on, boys. Or at least, you like, know better. You, you can 3D print now. Can we print the dad's faces and put the bus in everybody's stall? Yeah. Do you know how weird that look? <laughs> in come the hockey bags, in come a, a cart of bus. People would be like, what the heck is yeah. Calgary carrying around? <laughs> anyway, good overall game. Well, well, they had Jobu a couple years ago. But so, that's you one. Know. It wasn't a Jobu for everybody. Yeah, well. <laughs> um, the only dad that I could see that wasn't on the trip was Kachuk's dad. Probably not a big deal for him. He'd probably actually rather stay home after being on the road for years, but he took his grandfather. Well, yeah, well, uh, his uh, father was with uh, Brady in Ottawa on their dad's trip, so that's why. There you go. He's he's done dad's trips. He's probably been on both ends of the dad's trips now, Keith. So Yeah. Um, but overall, I thought a, a decent effort from the Flames. This is more what I expected the Minnesota game to look like from both teams. I thought some good offensive power on both sides, and Talbot came up big, made 31 stops to get the Flames a win. Yeah, I thought that Talbot was the difference in this game. It, I think that if he was just having an average game, that the Flames probably lose this one in regulation. But he, frankly, stood on his head, and he robbed several of the Blackhawks throughout the game and it he played a, a full mark effort in this one which is nice to see coming from your backup goaltender and then they put Talbot in net again uh on Thursday when the Flames come home they played they've played the uh, Minnesota Wild what three times in like nine days now and they play them again on the Thursday after just playing Sunday that Sunday was a high scoring affair which we're not used to against the Wild, and then we get what, more what we're used to, a 2-1 game. Talbot makes 43 saves, and we get goals from Ryan and Johnny Goudreau got back on the board. Yeah, again, in this game, uh, Cam Talbot was, I believe, the story, frankly. He made 42 saves, and the Flames played well. I thought this was like a punch-counterpunch type of game where each team had a lot of scoring opportunities, and if not for that bad line change that resulted in the Zuccarello goal, I think that Calgary did an effective job of limiting the scoring chances despite the shots against. Uh, I thought they played better defensively, which is 
strange when you give up 42 shots against. Yeah, 43 but. shots by the Wild. And as you said, I think in the last game, it applies here too, that you know most goalies who are taking 43 pucks, you don't end up getting the win. No, but... That's an experienced goaltender. It, yeah, and the thing is, is that I, I think that even though it was 43 shots, I don't feel like Minnesota had a ton of good quality scoring chances in this game. I just think they were throwing the puck on net quite a lot, which I don't blame him, but Talbot, he was up to the task, and he did a very good job. Yeah, you know, uh, another thing in this game that I thought was telling of these two teams, I mean, we usually see low-scoring affairs here, but four penalty minutes each. We didn't see a lot of marches to the box on either side, and I think that really helped with the flow of this game. Yeah, and I... One thing I've noticed with the Flames, as they've been more successful since the coaching change, is that the discipline level has gone up significantly. And, like, we're not having games where we have eight or nine penalties or, you know, anything even remotely close to that. And I think the Flames on the overall have tightened up quite a bit defensively and preventing the highest quality scoring chances and you know like if you're taking a shot from the blue line and there's no traffic like the goalie you he's gonna stop that and i I thought that minnesota had quite a number of those type of shots on net like uh, looking at the totals like there's uh 19 shots came from their blue line in this game and those are shots where the goalie like if there's no obstructions the goalie's gonna make an easy save on that yeah and you know cam is what it, despite what you think of him whether he's a starter or backup he's an experienced goaltender and he looked like an experienced goaltender in this game yeah very composed solid and minnesota's no got some complaints. good scorers and there was some times i thought when there was some big screens in front of the net and Cam knew where to be, knew what he was looking for. Like, you know, I thought this guy looked like a, a seasoned NHL goalie. Yeah, in the groove, and it's like, oh, okay, that's what you're throwing at me, no big deal. And talking about the Flames' discipline, I think the next game's a great example of that. The Flames get two penalty minutes to the Oilers' 14, and a big uh, Battle of Alberta win. The Flames win 4-3 over the Oilers, and what a great game this was, Matt. Yeah, well, you know, the Flames, they all have halos over there. You know, they were nothing but angels in this game, and clearly the Oilers have issues. Well, and it's not just being angels, but I mean, you know, there were some of the guys like Cassian who were trying to, you know, start something, and the Flames said, no, thank you. And it would have been easy to send Luch or, you, you know, Ronaldo out there and punch some faces, but the Flames played hockey, and that's why they won. Yeah, and... uh, Kachuk, like, intrinsically, like, those hits, they were clean, but not really. Like, they were... It, the first thing, like, I, the hit the themselves. first thing I saw when uh, Cassian dropped his gloves, I thought his old man would have answered the bell. Oh, yeah. Well, Kachuk, he kind of got grabbed from behind, uh, like, spun around in that, and it's kind of hard to drop the gloves when you're getting jerked around from behind and punches thrown at you and you can't defend yourself like if cassian had given him a second to you know turn around i'm sure he would have fought him but you know when you're getting ragdolled from behind and you can't defend yourself it's it is what it is and like kachuk those were borderline hits i think both of them they were clean, but the winger coming down and hitting a guy behind the net, like, that's not really warranted, but, you know, it happened, and it obviously was effective because it caused Cassian to lose his mind and take 14 minutes in penalties and resulted in the Flames winning the game, and he's now been suspended for two games, so... You know, it is what it is, but it'll make the next game uh, after the All-Star break very fun. 
You know, it's what I expect from Zach Cassian, though. I mean, there's guys in the league, like even Ronaldo this year, I think. I had a similar view of him last year that I did to Cassian this year, which was just a tough guy. And we've seen Ronaldo be able to play some real hockey this year. But to me, Cassian's just a goon. Like, there's not much else to his game besides gooning it up. Yeah, and those players are effective at times. And... You know, if the Flames had him on the team, you'd be like, oh, he's a perfectly viable fourth liner who can muck it up a bit. In very much the same way that Ronaldo can. And, you know, he can chip in a little bit here and there. But, you know, he, you do, if you do manage to tick him off, though, he does a lot of really dumb things. And,. You know, he got suspended for it, and Kachuk knew that, targeted him, and he got the end result that he was looking before for, we, which before was... Before we talk about the actual game here, when was the last time we actually had a meaningful battle of Alberta? Like, going into this, these two teams were playing for number one in the Pacific. I can't remember the last time it wasn't just Calgary playing for points and Edmonton trying to spoil Calgary. Well, even going back where it was meaningful for both teams, like, you pretty much have to go back to, like, 92. You know, like, 90, 91, 92. I think that's why like this it's... game felt so fun, was you know, there was something both teams were playing for. Yeah, because, like, in 89-90, the Oilers won the Cup, and then they kind of were mediocre bad after that. And Calgary was still good for a little while and then fell off the face of the earth. And, uh, y you know, it, it. then, like, in the late 90s, the Oilers were good, the Flames were terrible, and then, like, when the Flames got better after 03 04, the Oilers became terrible and have been ever since. So I it's, guess, well, I yeah, guess it's, it, now I'm thinking back, the last time there's probably a somewhat meaningful game. What was it, two, three years ago when we played our first two games against the Oilers? Yeah. I mean, that, I guess that had some meaning. True. But I think that was a big reason why this was such a fun game, was both teams were actually playing for something. Yeah. And, and Matt, we... The right team came out on top, so that's always And we always found good. a team that's worse in the face-off dot than the Flames. Hey, there's One a of first. One few times when uh, the Calgary Flames have more face-off wins than the other team. Calgary got 55 to Oilers 45%. But let's talk about the game. I thought a really strong first for the Flames. The first half of that first period, such a fast-paced 10 minutes. Like, there was hardly a whistle, and I'm sitting in the press box looking down. I look up at the clock, I'm like, whoa, how are 10 minutes gone already? Yeah, and, it, you know, it was a bit of unfortunate luck that the Flames found themselves down 2-1 after the first 10 minutes because that was basically the Oilers' only two scoring chances of the period. And they both ended up in the net. And Calgary was kind of just all over them, and it happens. But Calgary's able to fight back, as we know. Johnny tied it up uh, in the first as 13th of the year, and then uh, Dubé in the second, and Elias Lindholm for the winner. Um, I don't know if you were able to notice it on TV when you watched. Giordano was making some really good passes tonight. Like, I thought this year he almost looked like he was trying to do too much in a lot of games. And I thought in this one he was making some right-on-the-tape passes. He was moving the puck out of his zone well. I got to give the captain credit. He looked like the Giordano from last year. Well, not only that, TJ Brody has been absolutely superb since he's returned from his col collapse thing back at the beginning of December. And he's been excellent, frankly, ever since that happened. And the two of them have really stepped up their game more recently. And I thought, as you said, Giordano had a really good game and Brody did uh, both in this game and in the subsequent Montreal game. And the, the new look, I guess we'll call it the first line of uh, Goudreau, Monaghan and Backlund on the wing. I thought was a, they looked like a top line for a top team in that game. They were all over the Oilers and for a line that's not, I mean, you don't look at those guys and think there's a lot of defensive responsibility. They handled McDavid pretty well. Yeah. I, I like the Backland addition in terms of uh, the overall defensive game in that line, but I, I'm waiting until the Flames, if they do acquire somebody, 
it'll be somebody for that line. I, I have a strong feeling. You and I talked last week, and we got a lot of good feedback on that show and some of our discussions, but... You know, I, I still think, Matt, that we don't go out and make that trade. I think that's a position that we can fill UFA for a lot cheaper. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, just a few things to point out as well in this game. Cam Talbot and Net taking on his former team again looks phenomenal in this one. And really, there was not a Calgary Flame on the ice, I thought, who didn't look good. And when you look at the minutes, I mean, even Zach Ronaldo's playing 11 minutes in this one. Um, I thought that since Froelich got traded, Jankowski has been looked at to play more PK time. And I thought even Jankowski, even even strength, not this game because he was not playing, but this whole week I thought uh, the few he's played has looked good. Like everyone looked good in this game. Yeah, and it's it'll be interesting to see moving forward if Jankowski can reassert himself with his play cuz over I feel like over the last month or so that Jankowski has played a lot more like what we we've been used to. It's just that he still hasn't gotten a bounce to go his way and I feel that if he manages to get one that he might get 3 or 4. You know, Matt, the one guy who's worried being in the lineup for this one was Zach Ronaldo. And, you know, was he going to be a liability? Were they just putting him in there to, you know, to be a face puncher type guy? But I thought Ronaldo, again, in 11 minutes, played no special teams time, which you don't expect. He looked good. And I I was really impressed. And I say this probably every week, but Andrew Mangiapane is really looking like a top six forward. And I think in this game as well, when he was playing with Lindholm and Kachuk, um, I mean, it's it's tough not to look good with those two guys, but I wouldn't say he's a top six forward yet, but I think he, he could have made the case if that's the only game you've watched of him. Yeah, and I feel that he is slowly emerging as a top nine forward. Top nine for sure. And it, you just need to be patient with young guys, and sometimes they can surprise you, and... He looks more and more confident with each game, and it'll be interesting to see where his ceiling is, because it's kind of hard to tell with him where he'll eventually end up. This is going to be a bad comparison, because they play nothing alike, but I can see him being like Michael Froelich was here, where you know what he should probably be in your third line, but when you need him on the second line, he can step up and do that, and... When paired with better line mates, I think he will look a lot better and not be a liability there. Yeah, and he's quick enough where he can get up and down the ice as well, which that's something that the the Flames, frankly, need more of. I mean, Froelich, let's be honest, was a, a third-line guy on this team. Oh, yeah, and it's similar to, like, Michael Backlund, frankly, and... I think both of those guys for a while have been third and fourth line, well, third line guys, but we didn't have anybody else, so they got bumped well, up. Well, the 3M line clicked, and they were kind of, the, the hole was better than the sum of the parts. Yeah, and now the Flames are being able to spread things out a little bit more with the guys like Dubé and Ryan and Mangiapane coming in and being top nine forwards that you can kind of piece things together a little more effectively. Are you glad to see Johnny Goudreau getting a couple big goals this week? I feel that like all of the core guys, like they just need to get confidence in themselves again. And I'm, like it, you could kind of tell that part of what was going on earlier in the season was that they were trying too hard and when the, this team f tries to force things that's when they tend to make mistakes and like the passing gets really sloppy and they get rushed and like it's just like everything cascades out into crap and from there and it, it's like they can't get a single thing to go right and it's emblematic in the Montreal game where, like, it just that if they could get that confidence going, then, like, they're not, they can let the offense flow instead of trying to force the pass because, oh, we need a goal. 
Well, let's talk about that Montreal game since you're going there. The last game of the week, the Flames go on a road trip. They're on a road trip all week in eastern Canada, Montreal, Toronto, Ottawa. Their last three games before the All-Star break or the bye week, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, and not a great game from the Flames. They uh, lose 2 nothing to the Montreal Canadiens. David Riddick back in net. And I think Riddick was really the guy that kept this to a 2 nothing game. I think without him, it would have been 6 or 7. The Flames looked terrible in the first. They... We're back to the usual Calgary Flames don't play well in the first, get steamrolled. And I think they just got behind and couldn't couldn't come back. They got behind yeah, in the momentum. And, well, this reminds me of uh, after Christmas, the Flames came out and trounced the Oilers and came out and were just so dominant that it's like they bought their own headlines of, hey, we're just awesome. And then in the next two games came out so bad that they gave up seven goals in the first, like, 25 minutes of between the two games. And were coming down, trying to come back from 3 nothing and 4 nothing down. And if it wasn't for Riddick in the first period, it probably would have been 4 or 5 nothing. And it, this team... It, it, like once you're getting thumped that badly like they didn't get a shot for over 10 minutes in the second period and it's like uh come on guys you're only down by a single goal if you just start get you know get a shift where it works and then build on it and they just couldn't seem to get anything going at all and they it was an easy shutout for Carey Price after such an emotional win on Saturday against the Oilers the Flames being so up on this one I wonder if they came into this game overconfident thinking that they were you know maybe the best team in the league or they were better than they were and I feel like they came in overconfident and Montreal took advantage of it and I think Montreal just played better hockey and I'm hoping this isn't the Flames sort of regressing back to what we saw earlier. I mean, there's always, you know, you're going to lose. Everyone loses eventually, right? But, um, yeah, I I don't know. Like, I'm, I'm hoping it's just a blip well, after that big win. Yeah, and, like, this team, they're, they've been rather consistent in that they've been taking bad teams for granted. Because Montreal's terrible. Like, there, there's no bones about it. They're one of the five or six worst teams in the NHL this season. And it is what it is. And, you know, they're bad. You should be able to, if you're playing your game your way, you should walk all over them. Because they only have a couple of good players, and you just have to go out and try, and you'll win. But this team seems like they get their ego up because oh they beat the Oilers and they're on a five game winning streak and hey we can just walk all over these guys and it's like they're looking ahead to the Toronto game on Thursday and because oh we'll just beat these guys because they suck and then oh well you just got shut out for the sixth time in 27 games you know I guess on the bright side if we're going to give up two points I'd rather give up to an Eastern Conference opponent Oh, for sure. But, yeah, not a great-looking game here. I'm hoping it's a blip. I'm hoping – I can see one of two things happening. Either this is a blip and they come back hard against Toronto and then play this – well, three things. I think this could be the blip. They play hard against Toronto and then underestimate Ottawa. I think this could be a blip and they play hard the last two or they've stopped carrying and they're ready for their vacations and we see three dismal games this week. Well, I'll give you a little – look ahead if the flames suck in the last two games before the all-star break nothing will change between what happened this will happen this year and what happened last year and this team will struggle in the second half and they'll wilt this team hasn't been good if, we've had a bye week for what two years now and two years prior to this and they haven't looked good either time when they came back no and this team needs to be able to close out the last two games and like show that they actually care. It, like in this game tonight, like it really didn't seem like they cared very much until oh well, there's like t a 
20 minutes left. We're only down by one. Let's try to get some shots on that at least. And, and they've got a big game after yeah. the bye week against St. Louis. So I'm hoping they're going to be ready for that one. Yeah. Like, honestly, I wouldn't be shocked if the, this was game one of a five-game losing streak. I hope not. I'm going to knock on wood here. I hope not. Or I guess not yeah. wood. Compress particle board from Ikea, but I'll knock on that. <laughs> um yeah, I, I I don't know what to expect in this one. I guess all I can say is, you know what, the they didn't play well, and I'm hoping it's just kind of that high coming off the Edmonton game and underestimating them or overestimating themselves, I guess, underestimating their opponents, and I hope they turn this around before they go on the break. Yeah, well, it, it's hard with this team to not have a little bit of a defeatist attitude at times because, like, oh, you won five in a row, that's awesome, and then oh, you're doing the exact same thing that you've been doing all season in the sixth and, game. And a lot of the excuses they had earlier, the travel, all these things, you can't really blame this one on. I mean, they played two at home. Montreal's not that far away. They haven't been on the road a lot. Like, a lot of the excuses aren't there. So it's, you know, we, we know we can play better. We've seen it the last four games. Yeah, it's just very frustrating with this team. But... You know, it is what it is. And a five-game win streak can't last forever, right? It's got to end at some point. Nobody's no, won a lady two. No, and it's one of those things where, like, if they bounce back, and even if they just split the last two, that's fine. It's The concern is if they lose out between now and the All-Star break, and then it's like, oh, are they going to have a repeat of last year where they just waffle to the end of the season and... You would figure that being, like, what, six weeks away from the trade deadline that we'd have an idea of whether this team should be a buyer or a seller? But, you know, in fairness, now. though, just because you... I mean, we've seen them turn things around since Ward came. They haven't lost since the calendar turned to 2020. You know, even if you look at... You know, depending on who you think is the best team in the league, if you look at a Tampa Bay or a... Washington or St. Louis, they've all had bad games too. Like, you know, again, we've kind of got to split this into Jeff Ward era and, um, and, um, Bill Peters, Bill Peters era for this season. And I think, you know, in the Jeff Ward era, we haven't seen a lot of stinky games like this. No, I, I think this was this and the two after the first Oilers game were the three worst games that the Flames played. But, you know, it's just concerning, as always, you know, as you don't want to see, like, you you know, like, this team has the talent that they should be able to do more than what they have been, and, you know, you just don't want to see them, like, fall back into, like, they fought all that time to get back into first place in the division, and then... Oh, great. We're back out of it. But, you know, <laughs> even with that bad loss, the Flames are still tied for first with Arizona at 55 points. They're fifth in the West, um, 10 points behind St. Louis. So, you know what? It's it's a bad game. It didn't affect their standings much. I think we just got to wait the week out and see what happens. Yep. Let's shift our focus back to what we were talking about earlier, and that's Cam Talbot. We saw Talbot get three starts in a row in this this week. Uh, looked good, I thought, in all three games. He's had some up games and some down games this year. We're seeing the team playing, I think, now just as well in front of him as we do Riddick. I think the question for the Flames is, what do you do workload-wise for Talbot right now? If we look at the difference, Talbot has 17 games played so far, and uh, Riddick has 34 games played. Matt, if I'm uh, if I'm Jeff Ward or Jordan Siglet, I think I almost got to run the goalies 50-50 from here on out. If well, not, give Talbot a couple more how, starts. Yeah, that's where I was heading. Like with Talbot playing so well recently, and it's unfortunate that Riddick didn't get the win because like he deserved it for how he played, but. I think you have to, in the Toronto game, go back to Talbot, and I think you have to go with Talbot again in the Ottawa game. Unless he's terrible against Toronto. But, um... No, and I think that allowing Riddick some time off, it, it, 
it's also a kick in the pants to Reddick. You know, to hey, you want the net back, you have to play better. And like that was Reddick's first game that I think that he played well since December. And like the beginning of December. And you know, it's one of those things where you know, Talbot's playing well. Reddick hasn't been consistently playing well. You know, it until Talbot slows down, I think that he's the starter for the time being. And you go back to Riddick on occasion, like when he needs Talbot needs a break, and if Riddick plays well and Talbot starts to struggle, then swap so it, it sounds back. Sounds like you're kind of thinking that until proven otherwise, you would run Talbot as your starter at this point. Yeah, for the time being. Uh, it, and I'm not saying, like, oh, he'll be the starter in the playoffs or anything like that. I'm not even saying that he'll be the starter a month from now. I'm just saying for, like, the foreseeable future, give Talbot a little bit of rope because he's been good. And Talbot also has a very long history of being an excellent goaltender when he's not behind the Edmonton Oilers. Like even in he even got them to the playoffs that one year. Like he was that good, <laughs> you know. So like if it, that's a minor miracle in and of itself, then <laughs> you know it, if Talbot can resume playing like he did during that the early part of his Edmonton career or when he was with the Rangers, like the Flames now have one of the top goalies in the NHL. It, you know, it, like he has that kind of upside, so you have to. You're, you would be doing yourself a disservice if you're not exploring that to see if he's back, basically. Yeah, I think I agree with you. Right now, at least, I and looking at the schedule ahead, I think I would make uh, the default prediction or the default assumption that for January and I'd even say through February, tell what your starter. I think come playoffs. Riddick's definitely the starter, but you got to run Talbot until he's not playing well anymore. You put him Toronto, Ottawa. I think you play him in the in either the St. Louis or Edmonton game. Probably St. Louis. You play him in the other Edmonton game. Like you know, I'm just looking at most of these games here in February, and I would I'd make Riddick earn his net back. Yeah, and Riddick needs to take that next level of becoming a starter. And, like, he was kind of given it by default just because he was better early in the season. But, you know, he he's still a very inexperienced right. goaltender. He's only played 101 games in his career. Like, that's not very much. Well, and comparing that to Cam Talbot, who's played 305, right? So, I mean, by that, Talbot has three times the experience. Yeah, and he needs to learn how to manage himself as well as manage games better. And it's all... A part of the experience of learning... It's just like with Manjapani, uh, learning and seeing how he's developing and emerging as a quality top nine forward. You don't know what his ceiling will end up being, but, you know, he has to uh, learn to take those next steps, and it's the same thing with Riddick, and that's part of the fun of having a good young team is that there you're not getting a finished product yet and those guys might find that next tier you just have to wait and see <laughs> yeah and i think you know more than other players who you know like with forwards and defensemen who it's easy to if they're not playing well you can move them down the lineup or make them earn their time young goalies really don't get that and in most teams you're not fortunate enough to be able to say hey our young goalie's faltering a bit our young starter let's put the backup in and still be competitive so i think you know this is part of the learning for a young goaltender like david riddick and you know a guy who still played you know he's 27 he's not young on paper but young in the league and i think you know seeing how dave can fire back from that and how he can fight his way back in the lineup is going to tell son about the drive of this goaltender yeah and Riddick is not a known commodity yet, and we don't know exactly what he is. Like, he might just be a high-quality backup, or he might be a legit higher-end starter. You just don't know yet. And 
and like we're seeing even on the farm, guys like Gillies and Parsons are having excellent seasons, and they seem to have rebuilt their prospect stock after being bad for a number of years. So it goalies are voodoo, basically, and you don't know until you know. <laughs> Well, and the other thing you got to remember, too, is if this team's going to the playoffs, they don't want to burn Riddick out, no. right? So I think even giving him some time off, letting him rest a little bit, I'm sure he's got to have some aches and pains. You know, you're just buying yourself some time later on in the playoffs with some, you know, if you think the guys have a finite number of games they can play well, you're sort of buying yourself some time to move those to the back end of the season. Yeah, and additionally, you're having both guys being fresh when it comes time for the postseason. And I, and I think if the Flames are going to go deep this year, which I don't know if they will, but let's assume they do, you're going to need both guys. Yeah, like in the playoffs, if both goalies are playing well, and say game one Riddick's your starter and he is awful, well, you don't have to go, oh, well, the other guy sucks, so we're stuck with Riddick. You can swap Talbot in there, and if Talbot wins you a series hey awesome great and if he runs into a wall the next series you can just swap riddick back in and just keep bouncing back and forth like if they're both playing well you don't have to worry about the goalie tanking your season yeah or even you know i mean how often do we see i'd say at least once a year some team loses their goalie in the playoffs and you go well that's the end of those guys yeah like the oilers in 06 in the finals I still thank Marc Andre Bergeron for injuring his own goalie. Because <laughs> yeah, honestly, been, the Oilers been a few since then. Yeah, well, like the Oilers win the cup that year, frankly, if Rollison was in that. So thank you, thank you, Marc Andre Bergeron. He is my favorite yeah, so, non-flame. And I, think, <laughs> and I think part of Colorado's dominance last year, not only in our round, but most of the season was that they had two strong goalies. Yeah. And it helps. And like it, the NHL is getting away from where, you know, you had guys like Brodeur, Waugh, Belfour, who would play 60, 65, 70 games and then go and play in the playoffs too. It, it's not that kind of system anymore. And it's returning back to, frankly, the older way of doing things where – like back in the day like uh you had like johnny bauer for toronto would play about 50 games and like he was the starter and then they'd have the backup play the other 30 which i do believe was terry sawchuck at the time in 67 but you know yeah i think to be successful going forward you need a tandem of goaltenders yeah and calgary is fortunate where they have two viable options and they can bounce for back and forth between the two and uh, there's a, a very few teams that can actually have that claim to fame so it's a good well, asset not just two goalies the interesting thing here that i don't think anybody else has we're paying both guys exactly the same yeah true enough you know, it's not like in some teams where it's like one guy's making three times as much as the other, so we better play him because we're invested in him. Yeah, and yeah, it's no big deal either way. You know, Calgary's paying Riddick two million seven hundred fifty thousand, and Talbot two million seven hundred fifty thousand. So you know, together they're making five and a half million. Which, if you can get a great tandem, that's still cheap for good goaltending. Yep, I know. That's why it never makes sense to me to spend a ton of money on goaltending like uh, with like Bobrovsky and Price like it's so up and down that like there's not a clear cut difference in the groups of goaltenders of this generation like it was different when you had guys like Wabroder and Belfour cause like they were clearly better than everybody else but like it now the difference between like an average goalie and a good one is negligible like maybe six or seven goals a season difference which you know for four or five six seven million dollars extra it's like yeah i'll take the cheaper option and spend elsewhere <laughs> well i think with the salary cap too we're seeing teams that don't want to spend huge money so they're relying on the young goalies even if you're good for two three years 
and they find the next guy. Well, just look at Columbus. Like, they've got Koskinen and Merzliskens, and, you know, I found it funny that Elvis got his first shutout in Vegas. You know, how fitting. Uh, but, you know, they're going with a young, cheap tandem, and they're playing as effectively this year as Bobrovsky is with Florida, and yet they're not paying very much for the two of them, and Florida's paying $10 million for Bobrovsky. Yeah. Well, Matt, should we move on to another story? Sure. One of our defensemen getting paid this week. Uh, Rasmus Anderson gets a new six-year extension on his deal. It's a four point five million dollar average hit for six oh, for six years. So four point five million a year each year, right up until the end of the twenty twenty six season. Um, what first first your kind of initial gut reaction when you saw this good deal bad deal uh it reminded me instantly of when nashville signed matthias ekholm to a six-year deal for roughly around the same i think it was 4.2 then uh but yeah i thought that here's an unheralded young guy getting a lockdown long term and that is going to be a bargain of a contract I think that he's frankly worth more than that today, let alone you know six years from now. So, if it, you look at what yeah. our top tandems making now, with Geo making six point seven and Brody making four point six, I think in three years your top tandem is Hannafin and Anderson, and at both those guys making less than five, we're gonna have a great cap structure on that blue line. Yeah, and like. Uh, if you look at, like, Valimaki and Shillington are not going to cost you a ton either. And, and I'm just wondering your thoughts. If he's wanting to, would you bring TJ Brody back? At what number? Say six. No. Uh-huh. I honestly think Brody right now, and like you said earlier, he was playing well. I think his best value of the team right now is as a trade piece. Yeah. Now, here's one, another question for you. If the Flames are first in the Pacific at the deadline, do you still trade TJ Brody? No. I think at that point, you gotta, I mean, you need him for the playoffs. I've heard some people say, well, if you don't trade Brody, then you trade Hamannick, and I don't think you can do that either. No. Um, I, I think you need both of them, but I think even moving forward, Brody's going to be one of the better defenseman on the market and i think he's going to get paid an insane amount july 1st yeah i did i agree and it's one of those things like you know in terms of asset management you almost wish the flames were trending on the downward side so you could capitalize on selling off those parts because you'd get a lot for but yeah you don't want to be like edmonton and cheer for losses either so it's like we also yeah. need to not have, you know, short-term vision on this one. Brody has not been consistently looking like a top bear guy. He's looking good right now, but how often have you and I on this show talked about, you know, Brody's just not where he needs to be. Brody's not looking like a top defenseman. Like, you know, I think six million we're going to regret very quickly on a on an aging TJ Brody. Yeah, I agree. And it it'll be interesting to see what the Flames do moving forward with having both Hamannick and Brody because frankly I don't want them back for more than like two years uh, you know because like they're gonna start trending on the downward side of things and you know that those can quickly become anchor contracts it's just it'll be interesting to see what exactly they do to fix that <laughs> Well, one thing we've seen with Tree is he tends to sort of sign his key pieces and say no one makes more than that. So if we go with that kind of idea, if Anderson's going to make 4-5, is if they keep Brody, is he worth more than Anderson? Yeah. If they keep Hamannick, is he worth more than Anderson? Very slightly more. Just, cause they yeah, do diff say, just because they do different things. Like, Anderson and Brody are very comparable in terms of their style. But Hamannick is a different beast entirely. He's more in the Regeer-ish mold of defensemen. Not, obviously, of the same caliber, but, it, you know, that genre. 
and he's basically the only one that the Flames have of that type. So, Hamannick and Brody, Hamannick's 29, Brody's 30. I think both guys are going to go wherever they can get paid. This is probably their last big deal. Yeah, and I wouldn't blame them either. And, like, frankly, like, if the Flames signed Brody to, like, a three- or four-year deal at, like, say, five, seven, five, or six, six and a quarter even, you'd be like, yeah, that's expensive but doable. Uh, Hamannick, if it was, say, the same term three, four years at, like, five, five, two, five, something like that, you'd be like, yeah, that that's okay. Uh, that's about the going rate for a three, four defenseman. So, it wouldn't be ideal, mind you, but it would be doable. But I, I also I, think that with... With Valimaki, with Shillington, with some young goalies we or young defensemen, sorry, we don't know what we've got. I don't think I want to be bogged down with Hamannick and or Brody for more than two years. I think I'd offer either one of them a two-year, but I think you could easily see those becoming hindrances much longer than that. Yeah, exactly. That's why I wouldn't want to do more than three or four at the very outside. Um, it'll be interesting to see like if they can either trade for or sign someone else uh like if you were to say bump anderson into brody's spot and say valimaki into hamannick's spot you could more or less replace those guys internally and like your defense would not be as good but it wouldn't be like on a whole tier less good (laughs) Like, where you're going, like, oh, these guys suck, but we have nobody else. Yeah, but, it, I mean, if we're looking at this team as being a longer-term contender, you don't want to be in that position. I think you need Anderson to be playing better in third pair next year for the money you're going to pay him. I think that you can afford to lose Brody or Hamannick, but not both. Yeah, or if you do lose both, find someone else comparable to sign in their place. I think next year, Geo Anderson becomes our top pair. I agree. I think Hannafin Hamannick will still be the second pair, because I think Hamannick will be here. Yeah. I wouldn't even be surprised if Valimaki uh, was on the second pair. You know what, though? Valimaki's been hurt so much lately, I'm not sure they'd want to give him that much responsibility. I mean, let's just get the guy skating first. Yeah. Well, this is next year, so I'm assuming that like he's healthy. I mean, and... he got hurt last year. He got hurt this year. I'm starting to wonder if he's fragile. Yeah. Like the, really, the... I'm starting to wonder if he's a guy you can rely on as a top six defenseman. Yeah. Not uh, at least it, his injuries. It's not like the same injury over and over again. So like he seems to have a little bit of Sammy Sallow syndrome right now, but where it's all over the place. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, if he's always hurt, you know, you can't be saying let's let's not hi- get somebody else in, put him there. Then he goes down, and you're like, oh crap! I think you've got to look at him as your six or seven and make him earn his way up. Yeah, I can see that. Talent wise, I think he'd be a number four, but it's just yeah, as you said, and the Flames you gotta stay I, healthy. Yeah, I think that the Flames need to eventually backfill that spot, but. Yeah, with whether it's Hamannick, Brody, or someone of a similar-ish comparable, you know, you can find guys out there. It's just, it's always easier to get, like, a number four defenseman than it is a number one or number two. So... Well, and the thing to remember, too, is we got Giordano on year four of a six-year deal, and I think he will keep signing one years, and with every one year, he'll slide a little further down the lineup, like... I'm not worried as much about our defense. Uh, the thing I really want to see, though, is Hannafin needs to to really come alive. I think that they're looking at him and in that deal as being the, I think, the heir apparent to number five. Yeah. And he's good, but he's not looking that good yet. Yeah. And, you know, it, like with guys like Shillington, it takes time. It, it's just like when TJ Brody came up, like he was awful for the first two seasons that he was here defensively. And then he learned how to play at the NHL level and has been good ever since. And I think Shillington, if he can continue to improve, like his defensive ability is night and day compared to what it was a year ago. 
and it he's looking like an NHL defenseman now. It does is that the end of the road? No, by any means, no. He's got a lot more to improve on, but it's incremental steps, and he's at least heading in the right direction. <laughs> so, I think the thing I'm most proud of with Raz, if that's the right word, is I mean, you and I saw this guy when he first got drafted, and his fitness at rookie camp was terrible. Like he did not, he was not in NHL shape, and. To go from there to being in the NHL as a regular, arguably, and he's, what, 23 now? Like, this guy's really pulled up his boots and worked hard for this this gig and this new contract. Yeah, and, like, how would you say, when we first saw him, the skill level was plainly evident. He was the best of all the defensemen at the development camps, and the, the talent was clearly there. It was just the commitment level to you know the whole fitness side of things like i remember the hamburger incident (laughs) which that was hilarious but we'll let fans go back and listen that i think that was uh 2017 rookie camp episode yeah which was hilarious but you know but he's come a long way and you know definitely on the ice he has more of that swagger that and the right attitude that you need to be a winning caliber defenseman. Uh, Just asking, when you watch him play, do you see a lot of Nick Chalmerson in his his game? Like, just very composed overall? I don't know. I, I honestly haven't analyzed a lot of Nick Chalmerson. Yeah. Well, it comes from watching the Hawks when they were actually good, so... The, the thing that I think we're we're not talking about and we should probably at least throw in here is I think that, you know, the cap is going to get tighter and tighter. And we saw that this year with teams. I think that, you know, the cap's not just going to keep going up and going up. And the Flames are doing a really good job of signing guys, whether it's Hannafin, Anderson, Lindholm, to really affordable contracts. And if and when it becomes time to move that asset, I think the Flames are going to be in a great position because, I mean, what top – six or let's say top yeah top six forward with a Lindholm or top four defenseman with an Anderson can you acquire for less than five million like I think as these guys get better the Flames are almost going to be you know asking for more because we can give you a really affordable contract well look at the what it costs the Flames to get Hamannick and it was just because Hamannick was a solid number two three defenseman at the time and he was making a four million dollars yeah and you know like honestly i think that anything beyond just the first round pick was too much based on him as a player and the rest of what we sent to him the islanders was for the uh, cheapness of the contract and i think that the other thing that with all of these cheap contracts it helps to be able to shoehorn more good quality players in your lineup. And that's the important thing if you're wanting to win a Stanley Cup is you have to have like as many of your top 12 forwards and your top 6 defensemen being decent. And you know, like there's a lot of teams where like their third and fourth lines are basically, hey, here's some leftover trash that, you know, but they're cheap, so yay! And you know, it, and like we even it, that would be like having like your third line being Jankowski, Reader, and Ronaldo. Like there are some teams that have like that caliber of third line, and like Calgary with their contract structure are able to afford, and also thankfully with the emergence of Dubé and Manjapani, it allows them to have quality guys throughout their lineup well i think too then when you get a guy like a chuck who deserves to be paid you can still pay let's call it you know at or less than market and they still look like the highest paid player on the team but you have that money to shell out yeah well it's just like in the off season if the flames said say want to go and sign taylor hall they have the money to do that without drastically taking away from the team. 
you're still on this Taylor Hall thing. Well, he's good. You know, like, I'm all for getting good players on the Flames. Like, I don't care who it is. If you're you're like two years away from winning the MVP trophy, you're welcome on the Calgary Flames. Like, you don't think he's too whiny? I don't care if you're that good. I don't care if you're Phil Kessel, you know, or like the worst attitude on the planet. If you're that good and you have the talent to back it up, you can be the biggest jerk prima donna possible. That's fine. Go score some goals. We'll just ignore you. You were pretty big about not bringing Evander Kane in for the sole reason that he had a bad attitude. That was different because of the fact that he's not that good. You know, you can get away with having a douche on your team, but he has to be at, like a Patrick Kane or Taylor Hall level, not just a first, second line tweener like Kane. Evander Going back Kane. back to Theo Fleury. Yeah, like... Yeah, you know, he has to be a franchise caliber player, not just oh, he's pretty good. You know. That's why Okay. Yeah. Like Evander Kane is fine as a player, but he's not that good. It's just like if Okay, I see where you're coming from. You know, it's just like if say I don't necessarily agree with you, but I see where you're coming from. Yeah. It's like if Monaghan was a total jerk instead of the you know, soft-spoken, nicer, d- generally decent person that he is, you'd be like, yeah, we can do without that. <laughs> but, you know, he, he... It's a lot different if you're talking, like, franchise-altering caliber player, and, you know, you make allowances for, you know, personality <laughs> in that case. I don't know. I think personality is part of the reason the Flames aren't doing well, but we we can discuss Taylor Hall more at length another show. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that the contracts the tree is signing are going to, as we talked about, have a dual purpose later on in that if you're looking for a guy and Calgary can give him to you cheap, I think we can get that higher return. So there's, there's twofold to this. I mean, you don't want to think about your favorite players leaving, but at some point every asset leaves and... I think that's going to help the Flames maximize the return on those guys. Well, it's just like if the Flames were wanting to trade Gaudreau for something else, you know, that level of player at six and change is extremely cheap, and you'd have 30 teams lining up to trade with you. Exactly. And then the last piece of Flames news for the week, the Calgary Flames uh, call up Alexander Yellison from the AHL Stockton team. Um, I don't expect him to play at all. I think there's just another body for a Eastern Canadian road trip. It's hard to get a body from Stockton to Toronto or Ottawa, so you might as well bring him with you before you leave. What and, do you think of this and, one? Do you think we and, see Yellison play? Probably not. Maybe in the Ottawa game, but I think it's just a financial reward for his excellent play because I think he'll stay up right through the All-Star break. And he'll get that bonus money, like the you know NHL salary instead of the AHL salary. So I think that's. Just, I'd be surprised if he didn't get sent down. Yeah. Either way, I, like I think that the Flames will. I I wouldn't. I almost think that they will play him in the Ottawa game as a reward and like a thank you for signing with us back in the off season because. You know, he could have chosen any team, and he's chose to sign with us, and he's been excellent in Stockton. So, you know, you have to reward that, and you also have to look ahead to next year and see how he plays at the NHL level, frankly. And a team like Ottawa, who's terrible, you can throw Yellison in and not have to worry about it. Um, and see how, you know, like, can this guy be an effective number six? And you'd get a little bit more of a playbook on him if you can get fold him into it to see you know where he's at you could be right i just i don't think that i sit an nhl um defenseman in order to put yellison in yeah here's a question for you uh shillington is waiver eligible do you send him down during the all-star break i think they will just to save money you know, get him a couple more reps at that level and play at a high level. Maybe he and Yellison play together down there. I, I could definitely see that happening. Yeah. Do you think Dubé goes back down? I think that anybody who's 
able to go to Stockton without clearing waivers will be sent down. I, and they send them all down? Yeah. Just because, why not? That'd be... I'm just looking. That's what? Shillington, Dubé, Ronaldo. I think Reeder has been up here too long now. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I could see them send the three of those guys down. Well, Matt, we, uh, we've got a show next week. We'll be talking about the last part of the Eastern Canadian Road Swing, and then we've got a week off. And so for the 27th, you and I have been sitting here saying, what do we talk about if there's no Flames hockey? So... We're going to do this modern thing we see in business. We're going to outsource. We want all of our listeners to uh, help us out with that show. Give us something to talk about. We want you guys to let us know what your favorite memories of the first 40 years of the Flames are. The team celebrating 40 years here in Calgary, and we all have different memories of the team. We want to know what yours are. So if you want to, let us know your memories through social media, through our voicemail, however you want to get a hold of us. The best ones we'll put on the show. So you have a number of options. You can phone us. Our phone number is area code 587-200-7176. Again, 587-200-7176. That's also in the show notes. You can send us a tweet uh, on Twitter. We're at Fireside Podcast or Facebook.com. We're Facebook.com slash Fireside Chat. Or send us an email through our website at FiresideChat.ca and go to the contact section. We want to hear your memories, and I think this could be a really cool show to hear what everybody remembers. I know one of mine, and I'll talk about it on that show. I remember the night that Jerome retired up in the press box. There was a lot of dust because everybody's eyes were watering. Um, of course, grown men aren't crying. It was just really dusty up there. But I think we've all got our favorite memories the last 40 years. So let's share those with each other, and I think this could be a really fun episode. Do you have some favorite memories? Don't tell us now, Matt, but have you got some you th- you think you'll share on that show? Uh, a couple. One or two. It's It's been an up and down 40 years for this team, so let's talk about the ups. Maybe you were at a game that was really disappointing, and you know we're going to dig something up you didn't want to remember again, but let's talk about those ups and downs, whether it's a positive or negative. Let's share those things that stick out in our mind as Flames fans. Yeah. I'd love to hear from somebody who listens to us that was in the crowd and, uh, you know, when we won the cup, obviously it wasn't here in Calgary, but that round when we won the cup, I'd love to hear from somebody. Yeah. So let's, let's all share our thoughts. So get a hold of us and let us know what your favorite thoughts were. And we'll play those. We have a couple other things potentially planned for that episode as well, but hopefully we'll, uh, we'll share everyone's thoughts. And with that, Matt, it's time for the old prediction game. Yep. Two games on this week. E- Easy week this week. Neither of us got last week right. I'd predicted we would beat Montreal, Minnesota, lose to Edmonton, Chicago. You thought we'd only win to Edmonton and lose the rest. Um, it's sort of like mastermind. You you were wrong in the numbers. We won three instead of lost three. So neither neither one of us gets a point. But this week, two games should be an easy one. Well, I'll follow suit with that of hoping that it's the opposite. And I'll say they lose both. I'd already locked my predictions in here during the Montreal game, and I'm the exact opposite. I think they're going to win them both. Okay. Well, I um, hope you're right, but knowing that, we'll split the difference. So. And I'm okay with that. If we can get out of this trip with uh, you know beating one of these three teams, I think we're not doing too bad. Yeah. Not where I want to be, but not too bad. Yeah. It's not the end of the world, but you know, points are definitely needed, and the more the better, and... Uh, you know, we have an uh, ever-dwindling amount of games left in the season and don't want to be continuing to, I'm, you know, like every game being important in March and, you know, like I want to have a little bit of a buffer at some point. And... Let's say I'm not as worried about these two games as I am the two games after the break when we see St. Louis and Edmonton back-to-back. I would almost rather sacrifice these two games if those two are going to be you know, flames points. Yeah. Uh, I wish it worked that way. <laughs> uh, but you know what I mean? Like, like I would rather give up some points, to these Eastern conference teams, than come back and drop points to St. Louis, Edmonton, Edmonton again. Um, San, San Jose doesn't matter, but Nashville, Vancouver, like there's a lot of teams right around us when we come back and we have to get those points. Cause it's come down to the, the point of the season where dropping two could, you know, be the two that are going to keep you out of out of a wild card spot. Yeah, like that's why you know that Edmonton game might come back to haunt the Oilers down the road. 
be amusing if they lo- miss the playoffs by two points. Yeah, or if we can beat them uh, twice more in the week we come back, if they meet a m- miss by six. That'd be even better. Um, yeah, I would not be shocked if San Jose actually mounted a bit of a resurgence. So, like, even though they are terrible right now, I would not take them for granted. I th- no, you can't take them for granted. They've got too good of a roster. Yeah, like I think that like of any of the deadbeat teams in the West, I think that they're primed uh, out of all of them to mount a resurgence and climb back up in the standings. And we play them twice in a week in February, and I think those could be again if the Flames underestimate them, I think they could get really embarrassed by the the Sharks. Yeah, like they frankly like all of the games right off the hop until the middle of March like it, there are some quality teams even though it, they're basically playing mostly teams out of the playoff pitcher like Edmonton's all right San Jose Anaheim in the Honda Center Nashville Vancouver like a lot of decent enough rosters where if you underestimate them they could easily win those games and Calgary needs to learn that just because they suck in the standings does not mean that they're bad teams <laughs> well and i mean montreal showed us that i as much as i hope that they're gonna win against ottawa i have a feeling that we might see a repeat of the montreal effort in ottawa yeah that has classic trap game uh, you know it's like everybody's checked out it's an early afternoon game it's like uh oh i have to be at the airport at like six o'clock so uh let's get this over with <laughs> Well, and, and I think that Ottawa, again, could come back and, you know, embarrass the Flames. I, I think they could even do worse damage than 2 nothing that we saw in Montreal tonight. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how Calgary, uh, how they decide to play that one. It'll be That's the game I'm most concerned about. Like, I'm expecting them to show up for the Toronto game, but that one against Ottawa, yeah. I, I don't know. <laughs> it's it's going to be an interesting road trip. Yeah. Well, that does it for us this week, Matt. Do you want to take us out of here? Well, as always, hey, we're number one again. Go Flames, go. We're number one. We're number one. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.